Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to introduce the key speaker that is going to uh, give you uh, the next uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Eorg Drewes uh, is Chair Professor of Urban Water System Engineering at the Technical uh, University of Munich. He has also uh, um, served in the uh, uh, <coughs> In the, uh, he's also a full professor of the uh, civil and environmental engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. And he has uh, 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 scholarly activities uh, related to uh, uh, energy efficiency and water treatment and also water recycling. Uh, he, is also, he has uh, also collaborated with the, uh, uh, <coughs> with the advisor, advisory council of the uh, Waste Reuse Research Foundation in, in Virginia. And uh, he is also the uh, editor of the Journal of Water Reuse and Desalination. So I'm not going to lose more time. I pass the word to Mr. Duras. Thank you very much. Buenos dias. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction, John. Um, I'd like to especially thank the organizers, uh, Enrique and Peter, for inviting me. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and talk about um, uh, some, some different perspectives on MIR, uh, in particular with respect to how could we potentially modify design and operation um, to take advantage of uh, biological systems uh, in MIR. So I structured my talk um, to um, really give you some insights also on mainly water quality improvements during MIR. Um, and we want to do this by um, looking at boundary conditions that uh, facilitate biological transformation in these systems for various contaminants, but in particular like to focus today on trace again chemicals. Um, we will also look at how advanced or contemporary tools can help us understand uh, what is actually happening in these systems. I want to give you an example on using high throughput sequencing, some genomic tools um, to understand uh, who is there and uh, who is doing what. Um, and building upon this knowledge, uh, which is very mechanistic and at a small scale, we want to see how we can translate this into an engineering concept. And then we'll finish with some concluding remarks. Okay, so um, uh, many talks during this presentation, during this conference, already highlighted the fact that um, we do have a lot of different pressures on water resources. Uh, agriculture irrigation needs more water, urban irrigation, even public water supply. Uh, cooling water demand is rising, uh, maintaining base flows is important. Um, and all these might uh, speak for diversifying portfolios, including managed aquifer recharge. Uh, but there's one dimension that uh, tops all these, and this is climate change, um, which puts an additional pressure on water resource availability and in particular adds to the dimension of uncertainty. So from a planning perspective, it's much more difficult to predict um, how water resource availability might look in the future. Um, and this is also now starting affecting regions which have not really suffered from water shortage uh, in the past. And I want to give you one example from the Rhine River. Uh, this is how the flow looked uh, last year, which was an exceptional drought in Central Europe, uh, affecting drinking water supplies, cooling water demands, uh, navigation. Um, but uh, as this is also a river where significant riverbank filtration takes place, um, you can imagine that this is also affecting hydraulics uh, of riverbank filtration, let alone um, using surface water for managed aquifer recharge, for instance. Uh, but these rivers also uh, serve as a point where wastewater discharge is happening. Um, and when you think about less dilution, then uh, it's not difficult to understand that in, during drought conditions, during low flow conditions, uh, that contribution from wastewater will rise and also will come with some quality challenges. Um, there are multiple studies from different regions. I just want to show a, a few here uh, from Catalonia, for instance, that have quantified the degree of wastewater discharge to streams. Um, and you see in red and uh, dark red, uh, the percentages can climb up, uh, up to more than 50% of wastewater contributions in these streams, which also serve as a source for drinking, maybe indirectly through riverbank filtration or artificial recharge. There are other studies from the UK 
this is around Cambridge, uh, or Switzerland. Even northern Switzerland would have significant contributions to wastewater in these streams. Um, we just conducted a study for uh, Germany to um, quantify uh, the degree of wastewater discharge to all streams in Germany, considering more than 7,500 wastewater treatment plants discharging to streams, all the gauging stations, and we put these data sets together to identify from a dynamic standpoint, what are the contributions um, to these rivers um, as a function of discharge and function of uh, wastewater dis discharge. Um, during mean annual discharge conditions, um, the map looks like uh, this, uh, this image illustrates. You see the color green is dominating, which means that uh, maybe maximum 5% wastewater contributions during these conditions, but when we turn to minimum, uh, mean annual uh, discharge conditions, then uh, the map looks much more reddish and orange. Um, and now we're looking at 30% and more wastewater contributions uh, at a lot of streams. And this is not a short-term event. Uh, this is actually a condition that uh, usually lasts for many months. Uh, this is the discharge of the Main River, uh, which flows to Frankfurt. This doesn't work. Um, and. Uh, and you see that this uh, low flow condition really prevails from, let's say, April to September. So that's when we have the highest water demand. Um, and um, even during these exceptional droughts, we have conditions that are even below the mean annual discharge condition. So the wastewater contribution might even be higher than that. With that comes, uh, oh, an extra one, thank you. Um, so with, uh, with that contribution obviously comes challenges on water quality. We have impaired sources. Uh, it might be surface water receiving discharge uh, or it might be recycled water direct that is fed to MIR facilities and this relates to pathogen occurrence. Uh, there's an emerging discussion on the relevance of microplastics. Uh, but also, as we know, uh, discussion on the, uh, on the presence of trace organic chemicals from wastewater discharge. Okay, so let's turn to MIR and what, uh, what these systems can do about these contaminants. Uh, we know that MIR comes in many different configurations, as indicated here, and we all know about the benefits that we're looking at a multi-objective treatment process. So we can remove multiple things at the same time in these systems. Um, and uh, this is done with a very favorable carbon and energy footprint, and that really speaks for this uh, sustainable uh, treatment process. But it is considered a passive treatment system. Um, so from an engineering standpoint, that's not always much appreciated. Uh, an engineer would like to be in a predictive mode, how the system performs, how the water quality might look like at the end of the treatment. And that is not always easy to do with MIR, as we all know. So there are some drawbacks with respect to uh, performance variability, with respect to quantity you can get out of the system, quality. Uh, most systems come with a relatively large physical footprint, which is not compatible when you want to install them in urban areas, so densely populated areas. Um, sometimes heterogeneity is against us. Uh, subsurface um, might not be, subsurface conditions might not be suitable at, any, at every location, and um, all this has resulted in re relatively uh, conservative design standards with respect to water quality improvement, in particular with respect to pathogen removal. When you look at different countries, different retention times are required um, to assure certain pathogen inactivation. Well, why that is, is not always clear. This is sort of a gut feeling in many places. There's not necessarily science behind this, uh, what is needed, and you want to be conservative that why this uh, range varies so much. Um, Com uh, MIR systems are complex systems, as we know. When we think about what are really driving factors, um, we can think of many factors that might play a role in, in the subsurface environment. Um, but when we think about how, what we could modify, we need to think about where opportunities where we can change these conditions. And obviously, one key condition would be the water that is fed to these subsurface environments. So the source water quality might be important. And um, this could potentially affect the, the redox uh, systems, the redox conditions in the subsurface, and also as a function or as a consequence, how the microbial community might react uh, to this water quality. So there are certain opportunities. And in particular, we wanted to uh, look at two driving factors a little closer, and that is the biodegradable organic carbon. 
we all know that uh, in the moment you start infiltrating water that has some oxygen demand, um, then the system will drive from oxic to suboxic to anoxic. Uh, if you have accumulated the sediments, you might even see anaerobic conditions. So we wanted to look at the role of biodegradable DOC uh, in different um, levels um, to maintain and prevail certain defined redox conditions, and we did this in soil column experiments. Uh, and we selected some indicator chemicals which are known to biodegrade well. And when you look at these uh, results, removal uh, for three indicator chemicals, you don't see really much of a difference irrespective of the BUDs present or the redox condition present. Um, the, the picture looks different when you look at more moderately dif uh, or difficult, more difficult to degrade de degradable compounds, where we see in particular at a very low BDUC level of very little biodegradable DUC in oxic conditions, a huge increase in removal. So that obviously spurred our interest, and we wanted to look into this a little further, understanding what might be the driver behind it. Um, this is also consistent with other studies many people have published on this. Uh, when you just look at defined conditions, we know that under oxy conditions, degradation is much faster. Uh, that's more favorable. When we get under anoxy conditions, we would need more time for the same uh, to occur, or it might even not occur at all. Um, so what we did is we set up another series of uh, soil column experiments where we modified the makeup of the organic matter, and this is shown in this table here. Uh, we modified essentially the ratio between peptone as an easily degradable carbon source and humic acids as a refractory carbon source. And you see 100% peptone here, and different ratios, and then on the right-hand side, 100% humic acid. And we adjusted the same BDUC levels for all these different column setups, and just want to show you some results. So the different ratios are shown here on the x-axis, 100% um, uh, peptone, 100% humic, uh, and again, percent removal for two indicator chemicals. And what we see is that with more refractory carbon, we see more efficient degradation, which is maybe a little bit surprising, but we can conclude that obviously the composition of that organic matter also drives um, that degradation. It's not just the presence of biodegradable DUC uh, in the first place. So what is this DOC doing? Uh, it's a carbon source for a microorganism uh, to grow, to metabolize. And uh, when you look at um, the makeup, the structure of this microbial community, the microbiome in these systems, what we see is in this um, PO uh, analysis or um, principal component analysis that um, you have different clusters that form. Uh, the microbial community in the top soil in the first two centi uh, three centimeters is separate from the deeper uh, microbial community. And what we see is a diversification uh, of the microbes. So we see in, in the deeper zone much more diverse community than in the topsoil, which is probably explainable because of that uh, quick degrad degradation of carbon. You have plenty of carbon initially in the zone of infiltration, and then the deeper you go, the more refractory uh, and, and more difficult to degrade it becomes. So uh, beside the knowledge of um, the structure of the microbial community, the tools we have available today, the genomics tools, metatranscriptomics, allow you to also look at the functionality. We can look at what type of enzymes are upregulated for the entire microbiome. So all microorganisms present in these MIR systems can be characterized. And uh, you can do this by high throughput sequencing with MySec Illumina and different tools. And uh, this has shown uh, the transformation pathway of different uh, known xenobiotics. Um, and these uh, blue rectangulars illustrate some numbers which uh, represent certain enzymes. So we, we have knowledge of what type of enzymes can be upregulated in these systems. And we applied this, exactly this uh, approach in, in the soil column experiments. And I want to show you a heat map of the results. You don't need to understand everything here. Uh, what I'm showing you is, again, the top uh, samples from the top uh, one to three centimeters from these uh, sediment cores. And what we see is an upregulation of enzymes. Um, I'm showing you nine out of 18 enzymes which are essentially present in, in any cell. Nothing special about these enzymes. Uh, carbohydrate metabolism you find in every cell. When you go deeper, 
uh, in the zone where we have limited carbon conditions, the picture looked quite different. I'm, I'm looking at 18 expressions here of 106 upregulated enzymes. And I, I want to point your attention to the green uh, bar, which uh, represents the xenobiotic biodegradation. Th these are enzymes which are well documented to be involved in xenobiotic uh, transformation. And uh, in particular, uh, monooxygenase are listed here, which are also present in your gut uh, to detoxify chemicals. Um, so obviously, these are significantly upregulated in these systems under these carbon-limited conditions and might explain why we see a much better removal under those conditions. So um, again, what we need to note on these monooxygenase enzymes, for instance, is that they would only upregulate it under oxy conditions. So they might be present in the microbiome, but they're not function, they cannot function in the absence of oxygen. So while this happens in the microclimate and cells, it would not necessarily happen in an MRR facility if you lack oxygen, which might also explain why we see a significant drop in transformation as we go to deeper zones and the redox regime um, shifts from oxic to anoxic, that the slow, uh, this transformation is slowed down or some key enzymes cannot be upregulated and really function under these conditions. So what can we do about it? Well, what, what have we learned so far? We do see that um, if we reduce the electron donor relatively quickly, we get rid of that biodegradable carbon. What we could imagine doing is we could introduce oxygen again on electron acceptor to favor the establishment of oxy conditions. Yeah? Um, and uh, that's essentially the idea we uh, adopted and we, we thought about how we could translate this into an engineering approach. So imagine a riverbank filtration site, uh, short retention time, you have water infiltrating, DUC rich water, you get a shift from oxic, suboxic to anoxic conditions relatively, relatively rapidly. If you pull this water out and we would uh, aerate it again, and put it into a second recharge facility, then we would have a able, because of the low BDUC presence, to maintain oxy conditions for a long time. So we would create these favorable conditions I just illustrated we have seen in the laboratory, for instance. And we call this sequential managed aquifer recharge technology, or in brief, SMART. Okay, so how can this be uh, translated to a full-scale system? So here's an operation in, um, uh, in Colorado, in the U.S., um, this is the South Bird River. Uh, you see in the screen line a collecting uh, line of uh, 17 uh, riverbank filtration vertical production wells. They're relatively close to the river. Average retention time is only three to five days. And then this water is put into a second recharge facility. This was put in place because of water right limitations in Colorado, not so much because they wanted to establish uh, SMART. They did by accident. So this is a nice site to learn from. Um, and the retention time in this site, again, the central recharge basins here at the perimeter we have uh, recovery wells is another 15 days. Uh, so we have exactly the conditions on full scale I just alluded to, and we want to look uh, how this uh, is doing. Um, I should mention just as a side note, there's additional treatment happening after this water is recovered. You see the treatment trains here. This water then will make up about 30% of the drinking water supply of the city of Aurora. Okay, so looking at some trace again, a chemical data again. Uh, this is room percent removal, some indicator compounds, and I'm comparing the performance in the first passage, the riverbank filtration, for retention time of less than 10 days with the second infiltration, the artificial recharge and recovery site. And you do see the blue bars extending much further, which would speak for the fact that we do see much better improvement in the second uh, passage because we're maintaining these conditions potentially. Of course, if you look at these uh, basins, they are huge. Um, how can we really be sure that uh, these conditions really prevail? We all know that the infiltration pattern might be very, very dynamic, and we have transient conditions depending on where we have flow pattern into the subsurface, um, and um, that can also be obviously an impact. Uh, the way the aeration was performed was uh, pretty simplistic. Uh, some intake structures where the water was, the riverbank filtered water, the reduced groundwater was percolating over some rocks to re-aerate this water at certain locations within the basin. So it's not always clear that the entire water was properly mixed or re-aerated, but at least from an oxygen profile, we did see elevated concentrations in the uh, infiltrating water. 
Well, we also went one step further to look at some geophysical uh, tools and, and uh, insights in the subsurface heterogeneity. Uh, we looked at electric um, uh, resistivity res tomography, ERT, uh, on all these different sites. Uh, here's just an example. Sorry, this is not showing the proper graphic, but I think you get the idea. This is the central basin just show, uh, I showed you on the eastern basin I showed you on the previous photograph. It's pretty long, it extends 200 meters in length, um, and you see the red lines essentially for the ERT, the geophysical investigation. And what this uh, is giving us um, is uh, resistivity plots. You can invert the resistivity plots and then essentially look at that from a perspective of makeup. Uh, sorry, this is also not showing the legend, but uh, you see a clay, silt, and, and yellow, the sand makeup. And I also noted the uh, monitoring wells uh, we have close by, and that this was important for us because this is where we took samples and wanted to look at these transformations. And when you put these data together, it's this busy graph just conceptually. Uh, we can also look at removal of certain indicator compounds on bulk parameters for individual locations. And we have some insights because of the geophysical investigation, what is a makeup, at least on a, I would say, medium scale. Of course, we're not looking at the, the heterogeneity at a, with respect to fines, uh, that's not how this is resolved given the, the, the net here, but at least we have some indications where we have properly preferential flow. And indeed, along these preferential flow paths, we did observe uh, these effects I just alluded to earlier that we do see an improved uh, removal. So that actually speaks uh, for that you can manipulate these effects and you can take advantage of it. Well, how reproducible is a smart concept? Uh, we went back to the laboratory, did additional experiments, and I want to show you some uh, columns here which were fed with surface water, which part were partially impaired by wastewater discharge, as well as uh, mimicking this by mixing in some wastewater effluent. And we use different narration techniques. So what opportunities exist to bring in this electron acceptor? Of course, you can uh, just use air. We compared this to a conventional uh, riverbank filtration regime, no aeration no aeration or reaeration in between. And we also looked at um, oxygen, pure oxygen. Um, of course, this oxygen is depleted very rapidly in the first column, so I'm not showing you in the previous in the next slide the, the profile, but we want to concentrate on the profiles of the second column. So here in, uh, in purple on the bottom, uh, you see the um, uh, the, the air, so there's a little bit uh, air left when you do reaeration with air, but that is depleted very, very rapidly. It's not prevailing really through the second column. It's ex uh, ex exhausted very quickly. If you do it with pure oxygen, then you can maintain elevated oxygen concentrations for a longer time. Um, so different options exist. Um, and we uh, want to look at the removal of some trace any chemicals, again, some indicator chemicals, removal efficiency is shown. This is our standard, our control, standard riverbank filtration for this travel time of about uh, six days. Um, we have um, some removal of certain compounds, but let's see how this improves when we have um, in reaeration with air. We do see that there's improvement in particular for compounds which are known to be difficult to degrade, such as carbapentine or benzotriazole, and uh, it's even getting slightly better when you do uh, an oxygen um, or reaeration with pure oxygen because we're maintaining these oxygen conditions for a longer time period where we exhausted oxygen in the purple version relatively quickly. Nevertheless, this reaeration had this positive effect that we can trigger degradation of compounds which wouldn't degrade otherwise. Okay, so in Berlin, the city of Berlin, Berlin Waterworks, uh, largest uh, water provider in Germany, serving four million people. Um, is using riverbank filtration quite extensively. Um, they also discharge wastewater to the same um, reservoirs and rivers they're using as a drinking water supply. So there's partial closing of water cycles. Uh, some people call it de facto reuse. Um, and you can, that's the case actually in Lake Tegel. Uh, the red dots illustrate all the river bank filtrated, uh, the bank filtered uh, wells. And what we did is we looked at one um, island here which is equipped with river bank filtered, uh, with, with wells as well as with some recharge basins operated by the 
water company, and we, uh, the city was interested how this would actually play out if he established this smart concept, just conceptually. Because they have presence of certain compounds, including carbapentine, and there are some health advisory, uh, which showed up in their finished water. It's not removed during conventional riverbank filtration. They wanted to see, can the system be modified and tuned to also remove compounds uh, such as gabapentin. So we did compare this uh, operation. Again, this is the basin here. We simply, we utilized half of this basin. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Uh, this is well equipped with transects. Uh, we did this in conjunction with colleagues from the University of Oldenburg and TU Berlin. Um, and we compared this to an existing site where surface water is taken to be recharged uh, in a conventional MOR facility. Okay, so conventional infiltration compared to the smart operation where we take the water not directly but through riverbank filtered wells. We put them into the basin, have a second infiltration, and then look at the performance. Um, yeah, this is very crude. Uh, it's conceptually study. Uh, this is the original basin. We just simplified this by decreasing the, the, the size of the basin. That's essentially the half we utilized, and the reaeration took place through this, uh, spraying this water open into the basin. Uh, and then we had also um, piezometers and groundwater wells installed to look at the uh, removal for both sides. So the, the green dots are the uh, monitoring wells and at both locations. So this is a modified smart side, and this is a conventional side. I want to compare, of course, let me just tell that. Uh, you can also note from the, from the pictures that um, you have an open surface, uh, and this is also with respect to wastewater contribution rich in phosphorus. Uh, you don't need to wait very long. You get algae bloom. That's, of course, also resulting in some clogging for both basins, so they need some regular maintenance. Um, but what we also do with the SMART and this re is obviously oxygenating the reduced iron and manganese. So iron and manganese will precipitate out on the bottom, and this is obviously limited. If they have excessive iron concentration, then this, this would result in some serious clogging. Um, we looked at iron concentrations of about 0.6 to 1.2 milligram. That seemed to work. If you go higher, I would predict you need frequent cleaning. Okay, so let's look at the oxygen profile. So it's in German, but you get the idea, concentration over uh, depth. Um, this is a smart side. We are able to maintain oxygen uh, concentrations in the subsurface for quite some time, where the conventional side is declining relatively rapidly. Uh, this uh, DUC is not changing anymore, which is expected. This is a river, riverbank filtered water. There's no demand, uh, no opportunity to degrade this DUC further, but there's a slight decline in that DUC you see in the conventional side. Okay, how are trace again the chemicals performing? I want to show you some examples. Again, some more difficult to degrade compounds. Benzotriazole is a good example here. Uh, and we're just comparing the rates. And you see that the rate um, here is actually much quicker for benzotriazole. Uh, it's actually not happening under conventional conditions. Carbamazepine is an anti-epileptic drug. It's known to be very refractory. Even SMART cannot remove those compounds. Uh, but another example like valsartan acid um, also showed a more, much more rapid uh, removal under SMART conditions. So if you compare the rates, uh, that's shown here, rates for SMART, rates to conventional riverbank filtration, we see much better improvement and removal, much faster removal under SMART conditions, which also speaks for maybe less retention time we need because of the speed up of this process. Okay, so let's uh, go back to this concept, uh, and I, I showed you some disadvantages early on, uh, what sort of speaks against MIR. Of course, the same applies still here to the SMART concept. We need a pretty substantial physical footprint. Um, we have infiltration rates that still depend on the local subsurface conditions, so this issue of heterogeneity is not really resolved yet. Um, we have uh, pumping, or two times pumping. This is very shallow groundwater. It doesn't costs that much energy, but there's an additional demand for energy through this pumping and reaeration. Um, and we uh, likely have a more difficult time, given the heterogeneity, this flexible dynamic infiltration regime to strictly control the redox uh, conditions in the subsurface. Uh, and in particular in, in Europe and in Germany, regulators in, in general are concerned if, if we're not taking river water, but we're starting taking recycled water, uh, 
of potential groundwater contaminations you might uh, see as a consequence of this activity. So quite a hesitation on allowing MRR facilities to move forward if you have wastewater contributions or even use straight wastewater effluents. So we came up with the next generation of SMART. We call it SMART Plus. Uh, what this is all about, I want to explain. Um, we wanted to decouple this system entirely from the hydrological uh, cycle, meaning we don't have any issues of groundwater contamination. How we do this, I'll explain in a minute. Um, we also wanted to have better control on the sequence of redox conditions in the subsurface, not relying on that heterogeneity. Um, and instead of this reiteration, we thought about options of an in situ oxygenation or an in situ delivery of electron acceptors. Um, and uh, we're using or have the option of using adsorptive barriers, for instance, for those compounds which are not subject to biodegradation. Uh, and we wanted to maintain high infiltration rates because of that uh, high performance system um, and the fact that we didn't like the secondary contamination due to exposure to sunlight uh, or any things that might get into the water, we used uh, rapid infiltration trench technology to bring in this water into the subsurface. This was done as part, or is still ongoing with a lot of collaborators as part of uh, a larger study federal, funded by the Federal uh, Ministry of Education Research in Germany. Um, and again, you've seen this in previous presentation, uh, rapid trench technology is uh, widely used. Um, essentially, you, have, uh, you, you modify the subsurface by inputting in a high, highly porous and permal uh, zone, a gravel um, zone that extends into the saturated zone, and therefore you can infiltrate high amounts of water in a small footprint. This only works if your source water quality is compatible. So obviously, if you have elevated turbidity, this will clog up very quickly. Very difficult to, to clean after the fact, um, and therefore, more extensive pretreatment is needed. You would not be able to run a secondary effluent straight on that facility. Uh, you will see major clogging issues uh, very soon. OK, so uh, what we uh, did essentially is uh, put up a system. It's more conceptually. And then we also put up a pilot system here where we use this uh, idea of rapid infiltration in, in, instead of an open trench. Um, we modified the media by using uh, or exchanging the media with uh, classified waterworks sand. So what you use in drinking water filters, essentially. Highly uh, homogeneous material. Um, and this first step would be essentially here, uh, this first zone, which would go suboxic very quickly because we have a high oxygen demand. A DUC is degraded quickly. This is where the BDUC is removed. Then we have our intermediate aeration. We do it in situ, adopting some technologies from groundwater remediation. And then in the subsequent uh, passage, we have a uniform, uh, hopefully bubble-free, <laughs> Uh, flow that would maintain these oxy conditions for a longer time period, okay? All right, so that's the idea. Uh, this is how we put this uh, in place. Uh, you see quite a bit of uh, pretreatment. Uh, this is, uh, we're using this in a continuous operation, 300 liters per hour from a neighboring wastewater treatment plant receiving secondary effluent. Uh, it's further treated through a tertiary dual media filter to bring down the turbidity, and then this water is delivered uh, to this uh, rapid infiltration device. Uh, here's some pictures from the construction. It's highly instrumented uh, with um, pressure sensors, with conductivity sensors, pH, DO sensors in the system, it has a skater system, because you can imagine that the water quality going into the system is extremely variable. We don't have this buffering effect of a large basin anymore. We see any fluctuation that's coming out of the wastewater plant depicted in this uh, system. So we need a skater system, we need control to manipulate oxygen delivery on demand. If you have higher demand, you need to crank up the delivery. And that's why we need a uh, highly um, equipped system with, in, uh, with sensors. OK, of course, you can ask the question, well, would this work with respect to can you really establish plug flow that you have defined redox conditions? How about this uh, reiteration concept? How would the system perform? And of course, the retention number is much shorter. We're talking hours compared to days and weeks in typical MIR facilities. And how do we deliver this electron acceptor? We tried multiple things. I'm not sort of speaking too much about what didn't work, but I want to show you some uh, recent approach which seems to uh, be promising. Okay, some more pictures. So this is how it looks like at pilot scale at our shop. 
Um, it, you see the, the trench here, infiltration trends. Uh, if you would put this in the field, you would not see anything, maybe with the exception of this uh, trench sticking out. Everything is below surface. Uh, highly instrumented, uh, has sensors, and this is essentially a top view. The first portion has con is confined, there's a, there's a lid on it, otherwise water would not flow through the, well, would not flow through the tank, would flow over the tank. We don't want that. Uh, but I want to show you some trace experiments. We did multiple trace experiments, so there's a stationary flow, and then you see a, a, a tracer front moving through the system here from right to left, and you see it's not, it's pretty close to, I would say, ideal plug flow given the constraints of the system, and it looks like we are able to uh, manipulate the system in a way that we can control redox sequence. Uh, how are we doing with trace organic chemicals is shown here. Uh, the performance is not that great uh, right now because we're not operating the in-situ oxidation at the moment. We do see some degradation even of uh, compounds which are difficult to degrade, but it could be better and we would perform, we would expect this to be better when we start the in-situ oxidation. So the first was, was phase was just looking at this hydraulic optimization, look what the system is doing. What we didn't expect, um, but we also looked at pathogen inactivation, was the performance with respect to pathogen inactivation. And of course, this is in the context of providing a quality that's suitable for subsequent recharge to a, a potable supply. Uh, so we also did some FASH spiking tests to mimic the removal of pathogens, in particular viruses, in this system. So FIX-174 and MS-2 were spiked. And uh, these are the breakthrough uh, curves at different locations, uh, sampling locations, so this might not tell you too much, but when you look at the result, this would actually speak uh, for a five, four to five lock removal efficiency within 12 hours. This is unheard of for these type of systems. This would be a, a huge performance, and likely the reason for this is uh, this very controlled hydraulic front, but we also have biological activity in the tank, there's uh, a hypothesis of biological grazing, that the pathogens essentially are a food source for other microorganisms, and all these might play a role. Um, absorption on this media, filtration effects are minimal given the core size of this media we're using. So we're not having an, an, a very efficient filter. Uh, it's likely a different mechanism. We see the same for MS2, confirming this. We did this multiple times. We do see a four to five lock removal within this travel, short travel time, which is, which is huge. All right, so how do we go about this electron acceptor? I mentioned we're adopting some uh, uh, techniques from site remediation. Uh, and we ended up using um, gas permeable membranes because we need a bubble-free introduction of, uh, of oxygen uh, or air, and uh, this is key, otherwise the system will clog up very rapidly. Um, and uh, we did a lot of pre-testing on this. The difficulty you have in such a system is that you have different, or you have challenging mass transfer conditions. You can imagine the flow is about 30 centimeters um, per hour, so very slow travel through the tank. You bring in a lot of oxygen, so the gradient you form at this very moment is very steep, and you, the chance of degassing is very high. So that's why we needed a very controlled um, way of uh, controlling the mass transfer in the zone. So we installed uh, a collection of uh, um, slitted monitoring wells, essentially, and in these wells we inserted uh, these membranes, uh, gas permeable membranes, which we can control the gas flow. And uh, we just did this recently after multiple, uh, trying multiple concepts, and I want to show you, and of course we have uh, also in the cross-section multiple sensors to monitor DO in the system, and I want to put your attention to different locations where we measure DO and the initial infiltration, then at the end of this first suboxic zone, but before we do the re and then we're looking downstream again. And this is, uh, those are the preliminary results. Uh, in red and uh, yellow, you see the, the DO profiles right after this infiltration. Essentially, the oxygen is depleted very, very rapidly. It's essentially gone. When we do the reaeration with this concept, um, that's the green line, the DO4 and DO6, uh, 5 and 6 later on, you see that we are able to maintain DO concentrations above 2 milligram per liter, and that's all we need to trigger 
uh, this effect of the microbiome and the upregulation of these enzymes I mentioned earlier. So we are optimistic that this uh, will, will work. Uh, I don't have any results right now, but um, uh, maybe at the next ISMA conference I can report. We do speak to the Berlin Waterworks already about uh, modifying uh, an existing operation to adopt these concepts, in particular also the rapid trench uh, infiltration technology. And uh, this is a former waterworks site. Uh, it's a waterworks Johannisthal. Used to be in operation in uh, in the GDR before the wall came down. Then the water demand dropped significantly. Now it's back up rising. Berlin is growing, and the city uh, desperately needs more supply. And uh, this is one potential site they want to develop. Um, the river down here is a, is a canal. It's essentially 80% wastewater. So there's infiltration happening, and there's riverbank filtration happening already today. Here's some wells located here. Uh, because uh, since this was a former waterworks location, they still need to run these pumps, otherwise all the basements of these nice homes were getting wet. Uh, and they're wasting this water currently. Instead of doing this, they want to produce drinking water. So what we're doing and have explored is uh, whether we can establish the smart concept at this location, and this is moving now forward into construction. Um, and I want to show you the concept again. We're doing it as a demonstration scale, so this is not big, but at least conceptually to test this. This blue line illustrates the length of this infiltration trench of about 25 meters, one meter depth, about five meters depth, one meter width. Um, and uh, we, we are applying a flow of about 10 cubic meter per hour into the system. The blue dots represent the production wells in different depth, and the triangles represent our groundwater monitoring well. So this is the idea. It's an, it's a natural soil, it's an, and we're in an alluvial, it's at wa waterworks site, so this speaks hopefully for some or less heterogeneity issues, we will see. Um, but that's essentially the concept we want to move forward. We did some modeling on this as well. You see the trench here again. Um, and this essentially is a concept. You've seen the, in the previous kip, uh, photograph, I showed you the pilot scale setup. It's all stainless steel. Well, we're not going to build stainless steel walls in a large scale. That would be not affordable. But talking to the regulators, they just told us, well, you don't need a physical barrier to maintain groundwater quality. All you need to demonstrate to, uh, to us is that you have a net extraction that exceeds what you put in. Okay, so we can also, if we extract some native groundwater and show a flow balance that we're extracting more groundwater, we could maintain uh, a recharge operation with an impaired source without running into problems uh, from a permitting standpoint. So that's essentially how we set this up, um, that we can, based on the model, demonstrate uh, that we can capture all the water we put in, uh, but we're also extracting some perimeter from the perimeter, some native groundwater, let's say, and we can position these production wells in a way that we maintain a certain retention time. So we were targeting here about 10 days retention time. We want to take advantage of these quick responses, and the system is fed with riverbank filtered water from that site, what they're wasting currently. Uh, since this is elevated in iron, we're looking at 1.5 to 2.5 milligram iron. We will put in an aeration and an, um, an, uh, an iron filter to remove the iron before we put this into these uh, rapid infiltration trenches. So another cross-section, how this is uh, working, uh, and how we sort of can take advantage of this homogeneous, hopefully, plug flow condition to establish the conditions we, we want. We will also later establish the in-situ oxidation with this membrane approach, uh, but not in the first phase. Yeah, uh, all the engineering essentially is done. The distribution networks, this is a cross-section of the trench we want to build, five meters depth, as I said. Um, and with that, I come to the conclusion. So uh, I think there's a huge potential uh, to really further tune and optimize MR facility to see this also as a bioreactor, as a treatment system, where we can take much more advantage of than we maybe have in the past. And this will work for trace organic chemicals as well as for pathogens in a very controlled fashion. SMART does require some pretreatment. You've seen it. Uh, the system will clog up, and you cannot overwhelm the system. So if you apply primary effluent, this will not work. Uh, you need a certain quality. Um, but uh, if uh, we understand the fundamentals, then we can certainly improve these biological processes in, very in a very controlled fashion. 
Um, and uh, these favorable conditions can also be engineered uh, with some concepts uh, I showed you. Of course, this is not working for every compound. You do see some refractive compounds which are not subject to degradation, and you need different removal processes for that, let's say in a, a carbon adsorption filter at the very end, uh, which you can run for a long time given the low DUC levels. Um, but uh, nevertheless, from, from a uh, mechanistic standpoint and also cost standpoint, it's certainly competitive to common advanced uh, treatment technologies, including ozonation, for instance. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank all the sponsors of this work and foremost all my students and postdocs and associates that uh, helped um, pushing this line of research forward. And I'd like to uh, thank again the uh, organizers of the conference and uh, you for your attention. Thank you. I'm not sure, we have time for questions, I assume. Um, Yan Zhen from SASTEC, China. I, uh, fantastic talk. Um, wondering, um, I was at a talk given by Dave Stetlark, and he really was hammering that when you use these strong oxidation processes in wastewater treatment plant, you generate really undesirable metabolites. So I was wondering, in your, because uh, you're invoking more oxidation, so have you looked into uh, metabolites? Yeah, I mean, any biotransformation or any oxidation process will come with transformation products, metabolites, um, and of course you need to couple this, these type of invocations also with um, uh, effect-based analysis to look at what effects you have. You want to remove toxicity. It's not always desired to fully mineralize these uh, compounds. That's not needed. But you don't want to have uncontrolled formation of some byproducts which are problematic. So. I think with the effect, with the with the help of effect-based um, systems, that's one approach uh, that helps. Um, and also, given the retention times in these systems, uh, depending on how you design it, if you have retention times of of a couple of days compared to, uh, let's say, waste for treatment plants, you have more opportunities to further degrade any metabolites. So we have not seen any really issues uh, coming up. We do see some persistent transformation products, absolutely. Um, but they're not necessarily um, posing an elevated risk from a toxicity standpoint. Hi, this is Meng from Peking University, and a very fantastic speech. And uh, you just say you do the spiked uh, uh, experiment, and I want to know how do you deal with the outflow of all your uh, experiment? You know, there are still some emerging contaminants in it. When you recharge it to the field, I think it has a uh, very important effect on the river or groundwater. Yeah. All right, thanks for the question. So the, um, the experiments I showed you in a continuous operation were all using uh, wastewater effluent. We didn't spike really anything. Uh, if you do spike, we spike at uh, ambient levels, so it's slightly elevated to what a wastewater treatment plant would also discharge. From our pilot scale operation, all that wastewater we produce in our institute will go back to the wastewater treatment plant, so it's treated again. Um, and uh, the, the pathogen spiking studies uh, were done with Fauge. Um, the pathogens in the water itself, we also looked at that, I didn't show that. Um, that was the same amount that is discharged uh, on a regular basis, so we didn't spike any human pathogens uh, to begin with. Uh, here in the front is a question from Peter. I can shout. Okay. So uh, I'm only worried about the, the treatment. Yep. Uh, you should not have clogging in this, uh, as you call it, rapid infiltration trench. How are you going to realize that? <laughs> because yeah, very good question, and we did uh, learn our lessons, I can also uh, say. Uh, we did use um, just a rapid, uh, rapid uh, dual meter filter initially, so a tertiary filter without a flocculant. Turbidity levels, I would say, were about 0.3 to 0 0.4, uh, uh, 0.5 uh, NTU. Uh, and that, that did result in a pressure drop in that infiltration zone. So we had to open it, we had to do some maintenance on it, um, and we modified the pretreatment now with a, a flocculation, essentially a coagulation, to remove uh, more of that material, in, in particular the fine material. 
um, and that's something to, um, to look at. We do build on a lot of experience using these trench technologies. Um, uh, Christoph Schutt presented us yesterday in one session from Frankfurt, so the, the uh, water supply in Frankfurt is also recharged heavily on a large scale with using Rhine water that is uh, further treated and they're using exclusively these uh, trench technologies. And they've seen very long operation time before they need to do any maintenance. So maintenance consists of scraping off a sand layer, replacing this. Uh, of course, you don't want to do this very often. This would be not cost effective. So there is a sand layer on, <clears throat> on top of the gravel. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, maybe two, two to three centimeters only. Yeah. That's essentially sort of the last barrier, but if that clocks up quickly, then you're out of business uh, very rapidly, so. All right, I don't think I do see, that. there's another question in the middle. I have a question to the beginning of your talk when you mentioned different quality of uh, organic carbon. You showed some superiority in performance when humic acids were applied. So, recently I also saw a paper with your name on which showed that humic acids have basically no impact on removal of uh, organic micropollutants. Yeah. What is the consensus or what are the other factors that then determine the efficiency yeah. of uh, humic acids? Yeah, th thanks for bringing that up. Uh, so, research is progressing. Um, the, the triggers, I would say, are not completely understood. Uh, I think the research we have so far speaks to the fact that you need a, a certain minimum threshold concentration where you drive, um, you, have a, you have a selective pressure for the microbial community. If you offer a more refractory carbon, the microorganisms need to specialize, they need to diversify to go, uh, to be able to utilize that carbon source uh, for their uh, metabolism. And that requires a broader range of diverse enzymes. If you give them sugar, they don't need much to degrade this, okay? So this would be speaking for humic acid against peptone easily degradable carbon. If you drop a, a below a certain level, and we used, we used that in a recent study where we used very low concentrations to begin with, or even tap water, which is derived from groundwater, so it's more fulvic acid-like, then you're below that minimum maintenance level to even trigger that diversification. So that, that's something uh, we, I th we, we still need to better understand what, what is the trigger level, but generally speaking, uh, this refractory carbon triggers some selective pressure. Uh, if it's too much, then you wouldn't get that effect. So that's uh, our take right now. Thank you. All right. I, uh, was that a question, Peter? Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jörg. Um, a few years ago, the thinking was, uh, let, let's have a, a range of zones through which contaminants, uh, the, the water might move. Have a, um, an oxic zone and an, um, uh, an anoxic zone so that um, different contaminants could be removed in each. Um, and, and I was thinking particularly of, uh, say, tri trihalomethanes, which are degraded under an anaerobic conditions, but not under, uh, some of them not un under oxic. So the focus here is on the removal of chemicals uh, that are removed by oxic processes, but what about the ones that are not? Is there any advance in those? Yeah, so um, I, would, I would question whether anoxic conditions are sufficient to degrade THMs. Uh, you usually need uh, for dehalogenation anaerobic conditions, um, and uh, that's not necessarily something you really want to establish. Uh, that comes with a lot of side effects, which are difficult to manage. Um, our focus is on the entire gamut of contaminants, and we have seen also, for instance, uh, chlorinated flame retardants are well degraded under oxic conditions. It's probably not dehalogenated, but you get some functional changes that you do see a change of the parent compound, okay? So from a toxicity standpoint, that might be a, an advantage. Um, yes, there's, uh, of course, knowledge that we can maybe do better on also dehalogenation on, uh, on establishing anaerobic conditions, but as I said, this comes with a lot of um, difficult to manage uh, site conditions. It takes a, long, a lot of time to establish it. We need to bring in a carbon source, which is extremely difficult to control in a subsurface environment. 
Um, and that's why I would uh, favor for a post-treatment for those compounds which are not amenable to uh, this type of biodegradation. Yeah. Okay, so one last question. Gudrun gets nervous here in the front row, um, in the middle maybe, and then, or Peter. Very nice talk, Jörg. Um, what about, have you done any work with artificial sweeteners, things that are actually present at higher levels? Yeah, we, we've, looking at, uh, we've looked at Asofarm. Uh, Asofarm is well degraded under the smart conditions. Uh, I also showed it on one of the graphs, but maybe we're going too fast. Sucralose, um, if you like uh, sweeteners in your coffee and tea, I would speak against it, really take sugar, because sucralose is not degradable and under any conditions. It's an ideal waste water tracer, but we also find it everywhere. So sucralose, um, would be, would, if you're concerned about sucralose concentration, you can only deal with it from a post-treatment standpoint. Activated carbon would drop it a little bit, but not remove entirely. But it's well tested from a toxicological standpoint, so in that respect, no concern. Okay, thank you very much. Then we move on. Thank you very much, Dr. Drewes, for such an outstanding speech. Thank you indeed. So, sessions are starting right now. There are four parallel sessions, 12, 11, 13, and one parallel table about grip. See you later. Thank you.